the one thing that is most important um, in terms of the way that Jubmont have operated over the years is the full understanding of families. Racing has always been about the future. We're selling the future. We're hoping that there's going to be something there. We're hoping they're going to be the next Frankel and Abel. For Prince Khalid to put together what he's put together inside of 40 years is a truly unique achievement. He's been a, a, an amazing person, an amazing supporter, and what an amazing breeder and power he has. The trainers are obviously an integral part of this process. How does Judmont come to select trainers? Do you, do you stand by a computer reading rafts of data or, or is there a more uh, instinctive approach to it or is it a, a, a combination of the two? It's a combination. Uh, Prince Khalid certainly, when he's choosing trainers, looks at a number of factors and certainly their success rate, um, and, and what they've done, the tried and tested route, is certainly very important and, and important to any owner. Um, and then I, I think you look at the subjective things like, do we think that they would fit a Judmont homebred, uh, the type of horses that Prince Carly breeds? It started uh, when I was asked to go to Wargrave in Thames. So I flew into London and the stud farm at Wargrave, Wargrave on Thames, where I met with uh, Jeremy Tree, Humphrey Cottrell and Prince Carlin and uh, they introduced me in order that they were thinking of sending some horses to be trained in America and would I, in, would I be interested? Well you know the answer to that and uh, I remember the horse discussed with a horse called Bell Belide and uh, he came out to us, Jeremy Tree obviously facilitated the whole thing, he trained the horse to win the gym crack and he came out to me in 1983 in America and he was very successful, he won a lot of group races, became a stallion in California and uh, which is John Maybe's farm, who was a huge breeder at that time in both Kentucky and California. So that was the beginning of it. And then obviously other horses flowed on down the years. Alpha Batum was a great favorite of ours, won a great deal of money, well over a million and a half dollars in those days, and, uh, and Group Ones, with, ridden by Bill Shoemaker, Eddie Delahousse, Chris McCarran, all those top jockeys at that time. And also, I mean, horses like Hatim, uh, was very successful. He became a stand. He was a Group One winner there with Lafitte Pinke riding, and and we did have a lot of lovely horses, very solid. And it was really the beginning of Judmont in America. They raced initially under the name of Stone Church Stable, which was the name of a farm that uh, Prince Carly bought in Kentucky first of all. So it was the embryonic stage of the American operation. Big showbiz following at Hollywood Park. Oh yeah, it was very much. Uh, very popular, very big game in town with Santa Anita Hollywood Park in those days. And very much that old film set, all of them, they really enjoyed the races. And you'd see them there, whether it was Mr. Forsyth or whether it was old Cary Grant and Liz Taylor would all be there along with the directors and producers, Aaron Spelling and all of them. It was very much that end of that golden era of California racing and Prince Carlin himself would come and uh, come to lunch there at the races because his sons were at Pepperdine University in Los Angeles, which obviously linked in very nicely. And you relocated to Britain in 1989. You had early success with the likes of, likes of Tussaud and Ryafan. Yes, we, we obviously when I came back here, Prince Guy was kind enough to, you know, we've started from 1983 and now we're into 1989, six, seven years later. And uh, we had horses there, and obviously Tussard was a she was a fascinating filly to train. She'd only go anywhere with a with a with a pony or a hack on her own. She wouldn't disdain training in the string. And I remember when I sent her to Bobby, Bobby Frankel, who's a good friend of mine. I said, you know, you you get, this one's a little different to train. And he worked out very quickly. He used to take her with a pony on the track at quarter to ten, just before they shut the track. She lighted the whole track to herself and just hack around with a pony and then if he wanted to breeze, do a fast bit of work, she would only work out of the starting gate. Yes, so it was a sort of semi dress rehearsal. She wouldn't be bothered to work in a conventional manner by just easing to the rail. Certainly Bobby Frankel was, was an unlikely 
choice, but actually it turned out to be a brilliant one. And it came from a combination of things. And again, his statistics were, were, were very, very smart, albeit at a slightly lower, lower level in those days. He, he was a tremendous thinker, uh, Bobby, and a great, had fantastic knowledge. And he was a supreme horseman as well. He looked after horses like very few people. And, and so when Prince Carl had sent him Exporn, who was second behind Nash Ran in the, in, the, in the Guineas, he wasn't the most straightforward horse to train. And Bobby did incredibly well with him winning Group 1s. And I think the relationship then blossomed as a result of that. And of course, he, he became uh, John Mont's number one trainer in, in the US. Your partnership with Prince Khaled extends what, beyond three and a half decades. Mm. You've, yeah. you've had a very good and fruitful association throughout that time. How do you work so well together? What, what, are, what are his characteristics as an owner? Well, the first thing, you, breeder. as an owner breeder, the thing that you realize is that he totally understands the breeding operation. And pedigrees, he's an absolute expert on pedigrees. He can go back generation after generation after generation. And our longest, and sometimes, maybe in a sense at times, the more tense conversations over distance of a horse should run. I remember we were discussing at great length about Oasis Dream. Should he run in the St. James Palace or should he run in the King's Stand? And his pedigree on the dam side said he could go middle distances, at least mile and yet I felt he was very much a sprinter. And I remember that was a long conversation. It's very much a man you totally respect uh, his, his viewpoints on it. He really knew his families, and to this day he in intricately knows his families and how he's created them. Obviously, the beginning of it was when I was training for Robert Sangster and five or six fillies in our barn were purchased by Prince Carly, Devon Ditty, Zyzophone, those kind of brilliant fillies who had one thing in common, a lot of speed. And they became a lot of his foundation mares. So those families I got to know quite early on. And therefore I was able to, and lucky enough to train from those families that he'd acquired from Robert Sangster. Then of course, with uh, James and Guy Harwood at the, at the sales, they would be buying and some exciting horses like Dancing Brave, who was purchased from the face of Tipton sales. And uh, combining that with the female lions that Prince Scarlet was developing himself, you then had this incredibly potent uh, organization that has just proven itself time and again to be the top breeding operation in the world. Simon, the stallions are essentially the, the headline act of any stud operation, but it takes two to tango, as any biology student knows. And Judmont is really synonymous with the families that have produced some amazing champions over the decades. Uh, yes, and I, we've got a few of them here in front of us now. So on the left-hand side, we've got um, a special duty with, with Chris and her Galileo filly. And uh, then we have got uh, Photographic here, who's the dam of shutter speed uh, with her Frankel filly uh, with Martin. And um, then on the outside, we've got Hella Barine with Jake, who uh, with her Frankel filly. Um, and obviously Hella Barine is the dam of Calix, uh, who was Kingman's first group winner. It was fantastic when Calix won. Uh, we were all behind them and uh, every individual winner we have here we're all very, very proud of. We see them here come through the farm, um, but it's a real team effort. Uh, more so, one of my highlights of working at Dumont Farms to date is biometric winning at Royal Ascot. Um, you know, for us, when, uh, when he was born, you know, the whole team from when he moved, so you know, left here, he went on and uh, everyone, every member of staff on all the different farms, you know, they move over to Ireland and Biometric then went on and uh, had an amazing day at Royal Ascot. And for me, that's one of our most precious moments. From Prince Carla's point of view, he, he's always maintained that it's the mares that are more important than the stallions at the end of the day. And um, very fortunately, very early on, he invested very heavily, as we know, buying yearlings and, and buying very, very good families, which has 
led us to the to the state that we are now in. We have these wonderful families, the likes of Hasili, who uh, came from the purchase of Sukira um, from Robert Sangster, um, and Hasili, Hasili herself, as you know, as we well know, is the dam of five Group One winners, um, including th three horses that actually stood here at Banstead Manor. Um, although Dan Silly wasn't a Group One winner, uh, but certainly the two brothers, Sean Zelize and Kasik, were. So that's one great family, and of course, you know, the the, the fact that uh, Concentric actually hails from uh, a family which was purchased from uh, Dr. Schnapke um, with the purchase of Ferrin Stud, and that was uh, Fleet Noble and Fleet Girl, and which then resulted in the um, Prince Carly breeding Bourbon Girl and, and uh, a wonderful family it has become with over 30 stakes winners within it. And I think, you know, all Enable is doing at the moment is making up for the shortfall of Flintshire, who was placed in, in two arcs and, and um, two Breeders' Cups. Concentric's first two runners were by Oasis Dream and Dan Silly. Mm. They were winners and good horses, but not in Enable's class. You, you then sent Concentric to Nathaniel. Yes. What was the thinking there? Well, I know what you're going to be thinking. There's quite a lot of inbreeding, but actually um, with lime breeding, uh, if that's what you would like to call it, uh, I think it's always essential that you actually breed to the most prepotent. It doesn't matter whether it's the most prepotent stallion or some of the most prepotent dam signs. Um, the real reason behind it is that the you know, concentric comes from a family which is steeped in what I call middle distance um, classic uh, form. Um, most, most of the family are 10 furlong to 12 furlong um, runners. Uh, and at the time, um, we had taken a share in Nathaniel and I think it's fair to say that he was a high-class horse. If you took Frankel out of the equation, he's, he was arguably one of the top horses of, of, of his generation. So it was easy to support him. But he was an unproven stallion at that point. He was, but he, 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 he was a very unproven stallion uh, and it's fair to say that probably Concentric at the time was, uh, you know, first two runners, as you've already alluded to, probably hadn't hit the, the, the bullseye. Um, so it, it, was, it was probably easier to send her in, in, at that stage of her career. Yeah, I think she produced, you know, some nice listed class stock. But remember, she's related to Flintshire, and Flintshire came through to be a brilliant, a very brilliant horse, now a stallion, and a very much a top of the ground horse. And I think it can often happen in these families, it's, it's just being lucky enough to find the right combination. And remember when, when you mate the mares, the genetic wheels are turning. You never quite know where they're going to lock. The full brother and the full sister, or the two full brothers, can bear little relation to one another. I remember people always saying, Nijinsky, Minsky, are they brothers? You know, going back a long way, but that was quite a dramatic case. And I think from that point of view, it's not so much trial as error, you're trying to reduce the margin for error, I think, when you're breeding. And so it's your physiological matches as well as your niches in the families and ones that work. And the truth is really, in the end, don't despair, never give up. Early on, how much of a help was it, the fact that she was by Nathaniel, a relatively young stallion, but a horse that, that you had trained to great success? Well, it, it, it does help. And the first thing I knew, that he, he was not a bad two-year-old. He was second twice, beaten by a certain horse called Frankel first time out, and then beaten, Henry went and beat him again at Doncaster by a short head with another horse. I said, Henry, this is, this is like mobbing us up here, you know, with a, with a, with a, with a, with a Judmont horse again. So... Um, so for Nathaniel, you know, he then, but he showed class at two and then he got better and better with age. And I think the thing is with, with Enable, it was very obvious, do not be in a hurry here. Do not be, give her every chance to mature and strengthen. So her one run was November, Newcastle, straight mile, nice track. From there, obviously, she, uh, she reappeared uh, at Newbury, where she was beaten by shutter speed. And then... Almost, I think Frankie described it as almost a light bulb moment when she won at Chester, that she had done something that he hadn't expected her to do, and then he he said he thought that she. Yeah, I think special. that's fair. I mean, it slightly frustrated me with the Phillies won one race like she and Shutterspeed had. We were forced into a conditions race with Colts. They now have improved the program. I hated running two in the same race. Shutter speed was a little more forward at the time. William Road enabled did nothing wrong. I think he rather 
stayed in a little bit cord in and he, he let Shuttlespeed go because that was a polite thing to do. Then he got up and ran on well. Um, but having said that, I think Ryan was a little shocked when he came to draw towards her in the Cheshire Oaks and she just went. She just found another gear and was gone. And I remember Ryan being pretty impressed that day. Well, when she won first time, she wasn't there flash. She won, uh, you know, we, we thought she was a nice filly. And, and uh, you know, because she's quite laid back in the morning, so it's very hard to judge her because uh, she, does, she only does what she has to do. And it wasn't until I rode her at Chester that uh, she really surprised me because I, you know she's, she's she's a big girl. I thought, well, she's you know she's a you know more, more of a uh, galloper, but uh, that day at Chester for a, for a big girl to do what she did, you know to to show tremendous turn of foot around the bend, I realised then she was something special. She, you know she went into the Oaks. She, I don't think she was favourite, but. We knew in the back of our minds that she was going to put on a good performance, and uh, and we were we were treated as to uh, to, to an amazing race because she won by five lengths, and and you know even by my standard, I didn't expect her to do that. And obviously, the rest, as I say, is history because she just showed enormous exuberance in her racing throughout her three-year-old career, in, in all those Oaks and King Georges, and uh, and then the Ark. In the arc, she had a difficult draw. Two at Chanty is a horrible draw. It's not like uh, Longchamp, because if you look down the track, that's a straight coming at you. You come out the gate, you angle left. And of course, Frankie stood there in the two store looking before the race, and he said, if I'm not in a certain position by the 400 meters, that tower, I'm history, because I'm pinned on the rail. I've got to get out quick. I've got to get down. I've got to one off the rail. And if you watch that, he won the race in the first 400 meters, because without that, they pull it up around Shanti, you're trapped, you're finished, and they can keep you in there, you never get out. We were show price favourite, and uh, you know, a again, she, she did what she's been doing all year. She uh, travelled with great exuberance and showed a good turn of foot and won a Arc de Triumph by two and a half lengths, but pretty amazing, I would say. Last year was a nightmare. Uh, she, she, she had a little little burst of thing that leaked due to a little bit of bone rubbing it. Nothing, not, nothing, in, nothing mechanical, just something rubbing. It wasn't any structural problem. But it caused her to have to have surgery. She came back from surgery. We didn't get the races until she ran well in the September, won it nicely, and then she got sick. Nothing was told to me. You know, I, I think it was, maybe it was a good thing that I didn't know. And, you know, she missed... Uh, a chunk of work before the arc, so you know, I, I, when, when I, when, obviously, as we know, she won the arc, uh, but I, 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 I rode uh, like I usually do, and uh, I felt like the last hundred yards she actually got tired, and uh, what it looks like, sea of class was gaining on me. I think it was more like neighbor stopped, uh, because I guess that little bit that she missed before the arc took his stall and, uh, and and we got away with it you know uh, you know uh, it's, it's plain obvious to everyone that you know perhaps another 50 yards I would have finished second but I think it was more of the case that you know we didn't have a smooth run at it uh, like John will tell you uh, we, 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 we missed a, a bit of time and I would say that day she was probably 85 percent uh, but Anyway, she's won. And then we were able to go to America and, uh, you know, to become the first horse to win an arc in the British Cup in the same year uh, was, was, was amazing. And you know what? And also, it's nice to showcase our champions abroad, you know. Uh, she's been to France and, uh, you know, to take her to America and, you know, and, and she, she had an amazing following. I mean, uh, she was treated like a film star, you know, uh, she was followed by cameras and, and, you know, great that she performed and she won and she was uh, very well applauded by everyone. She put you in the shadows, did she? Yes, she did for once. <laughs> it was all about her and that's the way she should be. She's a, she's a champion. This year has been a, it looks from the outside as though this has been a much smoother process. She stepped back to 10 furlongs to win an eclipse, which was the first time she'd won a group one over that trip. I think you said going into that race that you were perfectly happy about her going back in distance. 
Yeah, I was. And Sandan is a lovely, you know, to her is a mile and a quarter where you climb the last four, which really suits her. She went in there 85 to 90. I thought that was where I wanted her. That, in my opinion, is how you want a horse to go into its first race. If you've got them up at 100% and fully cranked, it, you, can, you, can lose, you, can, you can just come the other way again. So it, it was a perfect prep for the King George. Frankie rode her beautifully, hands and heels. And in the King George, one flick, hands and heels. So you can't do it any more cheekily than that, that's for sure. You know, I never doubt uh, that uh, she didn't have enough speed for 10. But, uh, you know, sundown, it can be a pretty testing track. And, uh, yeah, she won, uh, you know, for a horse, you know, for, for sti first time up, I thought it was a great performance. And you said going into York that this was a, a potential banana skin, three opponents, no, really, no one really knew what the tactics were going to be, all, all, the, all those potential... Uh, things for a, for a messy race and possibly a, 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 a shot result. Yeah, which is why we were very clear that she's got a, she's got a great gait speed. She jumped, she's in there. She showed that in all of her races and even in the, this year in the uh, in the Eclipse, she was very you know she used old Hunting Horn as a as a as a lead horse rather than a an unnecessary attendant. But I think Frankie sort of went quick at the head of the straight, which surprised me. I, I asked him, why did you move so soon? He said, because I felt like it. Well, then argue with the jockey's instinct. When I got to the tour, he says, come on, enable short the world what you got. And, you know, she's put their light to the others. And uh, she felt in great shape. And uh, now all roads lead to Longchamp for uh, something that has not been done before. Tried to win three arcs. You know, Trev tried it, failed. You know, uh, we're not going to take... Uh, anybody for granted she's got every credential to to, to to be able to do it and uh, fingers crossed let's hope we can get her there in uh, tip top shape we're pleased her at the moment it's a long way to go it was important that she ran she she doesn't like to get, do nothing she gets too fresh and a bit silly with it and you filled her this morning monday morning coming back in and she'd been had a walk for 20 minutes she had a, 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 a trot a canter and she's walking back in and she just starts dancing and playing because she saw a tripod of a camera. Well, what's that doing there? So she started telling us. So she's very expressive that way. So she's a filly that she enjoys her training. So putting that race nicely spaced six weeks ahead of the arc suits her. Win, lose or draw in the arc, where does she sit in the horses that you've trained when it comes to A, her achievement and B, her ability? Well, achievement, superb, ability, I mean, obviously right up there. She's a long way the best mile and a half filly I've ever trained and ever will. Uh, how incredibly fortunate to have her. I mean, bred by, bred by a man who really knows his families, uh, that one's been with a long time. It's all very fulfilling. And uh, for Frankie, I mean, I, honestly, uh, I told him, you know, you're going to have to try and say something. Win, lose or draw at Longshore. Please come out with one word. Sorry if we get beat or whatever, but uh, you know she's she's one of those horses of a lifetime. There's no doubt about it. Even if she does win the arc, I mean, you know, I I never. I mean, I rode some great horses and very hard to compare the brilliance of other champions that I've rode. But a CV or a racehorse that she has, I don't remember. You know, you might have to go back hundred years or maybe Brigadier Girard. But he never won two arcs. Uh, so, you know, we, we have to go back, you know, many years to, to, to have a horse with a CV like it. And uh, so she always, even if she doesn't win the third arc, she will always be remembered as being a, an unbelievable horse. When the time does come for her to breed, having looked at the champions, the female champions especially, that you've trained in the past, who have gone on to brood, to be uh, broodmares, how do you see her uh, in, a, in that second career? Well, I hope she'll do well. There's often an argument that uh, some of the great, great race mares, I don't want to say this in a sexist way, but they're nearly too masculine and too hard that in a way they don't nurture their fold. Sometimes the unraceful sister is more of the mothering type, and I've seen plenty of evidence of that. I'd be hopeful with her that she's a big, strong girl. She can carry a fold. It's not like she's one of those rather tight, twisted ones who literally spits the folds out. I would hope that she could have a fold of some scope. 
you know, there's a risk to breeding, as we all know. I would hope that she could make a bee. She's very affectionate when she's chilled and let down. When she's racing, you go in that box, that's her space. You better show respect or she will whack you right out of it. She's very domineering that way. But I could see her being very maternal with a foe, yeah. I know, I know I'm not going to be around for, forever, but uh, be, it'd be nice to see uh, the protege of Enable in the future. And Enable is just getting on top from Rhododendron, and Enable wins the Oaks. Enable is going to win the Double Oaks, wins in great style. It's Enable under Frankie Dettori to win the Coral Eclipse. 13 out of 14, the arc is next, Enable all the way winner of the Dali Yorkshire Oaks. So you, you saw the stud books in the office from uh, 19, summer 1983 right through to, well, through to 2019, obviously. But this is an interesting one. This is when things were at the very beginning. You had Jeremy Tree training. Obviously had 28 horses for Prince Khalid. And Guy Harwood, Ron Smythe, Frankie Durr, Barry Hills, Bill Elsie, Olivier Dueb. Steve Damaro in America with two horses, and I trail at the bottom, but with one particular horse called Bel Belide we talked about earlier. So these, this is the embryonic stage of, of the Judmont Farms, 1983, and some of the mares there are the ones that uh, had just been purchased from Robert Sangster, but he's like Monroe and, and Zyzophone and uh, Devon Ditty. So they all, and Cameo Shaw. Which, so this was really the beginning of it all, and from there the book has got Slightly bigger now in 2019, uh, change colour, but uh, obviously all of these families tracing right back to here. And all done in a period inside 40 years, with the stallions here in the back, Arrogate as well, who was a purchased horse, not, not, not bred. So Prince Scarlet has always been careful to look in the markets for well-bred fillies and a colt that was interest to his very good managers. Uh, Garrett O'Rourke, in that case, uh, bought Arrogate at the, at the sales. And of course, the illustrious Frank Holt, there he is with all of his produce. So everything in, in this book, and uh, certainly a massive and amazing lifetime's achievement. And Zender, of course, another very prominent member of, of the Judmont family, a uh, Paul de Sede Pouliche winner for John Gosden and the Dan. Yes, but a, a family again, um, Bahamian had been bought uh, as a yearling um, and, and really it, it's a family that's gone from strength to strength. When you actually look back, you have Pete Hollow in there, who stood here as a stallion as well. And New Bay comes from that family, Oasis Dream comes from that family and, and, and now Kingman. So it is a family that has a, a number of stallions within it. Um, and uh, it, it's a family that we actually love. You could talk about the Mafida family and, and Zyzophon and uh, Zophonic and Zamandar, who all stood here, which then bleeds on to midsummer, midday. So some of the, the great fillies that we've, we've, we've had. Um, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully midday will provide us with a, with a standing song. I think racing has always been about the future. We're all we're selling the future. The yearlings, we're hoping that there's going to be something there. We're hoping they're going to be the next Frankel and Naval. Those that it's 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 part of uh, it's a part of our DNA.